And we are now recording. So one more time, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Megan Barrett. I'm the director at the Iowa Quilt Museum and I am here in the gallery of the Iowa Quilt Museum, um, or sitting in front of this beautiful quilt um, that we'll talk about a little bit later. If you're none familiar with the Iowa Quilt Museum, we are located in Winterset, Iowa, just southwest of Des Moines. We're a quick little drive from Des Moines and are easily accessible from either I-35 headed north and south or I-80 if you're traveling east or west. Um, and I tell you all of that because as of Monday, we will be open for visitor traffic again. Um, we have some stipulations that we're going to be putting in place in order to do our best to keep visitors, volunteers, and staff safe. But we are going to reopen our doors on Monday, June 1st. So uh, welcome again to this virtual meeting um, for our man-made exhibit. Um, we've got Marianne Fons with us. Um, she is the board president uh, here at the Iowa Quilt Museum um, and founding partner of Fons and Porter's Love of Quilting. We're also joined by Tony Jacobson, who is one of the founding board members here at the Iowa Quilt Museum, a fantastic quilter, teacher, designer, all of the things, and the curator of this exhibit, this man-made exhibit, and um, sharing the screen are Marty and Richard Michelle joining us from Atlanta. So um, we're gonna get back to Marty and Richard in just a minute, um, but I'm gonna go ahead and spotlight Tony's video right now um, and ask him to share with us a little bit about just an overview of this exhibit and how he conceived of his idea for the man-made exhibit. Tony? All right. Yeah, um, I w when I was looking at this show, I've seen a lot of uh, men's quilt shows that are basically um, ones that are juried and they're mainly art quilts. And so they're showing contemporary art quilts and they really don't get into the historical aspects of men quilting. So that's one of the things I wanted to do with this exhibit was definitely point out that men have been quilting along with the women for quite a while. The quilt we'll be talking about today was done by Jacob Schaffner in 1890. It was great to, to find a quilt and I, and I appreciate that um, Marty has let it, loaned it for the exhibit um, that shows that as far back as 1890, um, it was, you know, we had something that showed that men were quilting. Um, because not every quilt back then was even, you know, you didn't know who made it um, or any of, that, any of that information. So it's great to have it. So one of the things I, that was one of the things I wanted to show was being able to show historical quilts that um, were done by men. We've got the one from 1890. We've got um, two from 1935 and we have one from 1964 that show that men have been um, quilting for quite a while. Um, the other thing I want to do was show the various ways that men are involved in quilting today. And so I've got um, quilts from quilters who are um, pattern designers and then they teach and go around to do, give guild, ex, um, guild presentations. Um, I've got some who just do it for an art form. Uh, We've got others who are doing it for, um, because they wanna do, um, bring attention to a cause that's um, near and dear to them. And we've also got one, people that we would consider celebrities in the quilting world that, you know, if you're, you're involved in quilting in any fashion, you've probably heard their names. And so I wanted to show the wide variety, not just show the, you know, the, maybe the top art quilters, but show that there is a wide variety of how men are participating in quilting. So. And part of it is I like the stories that go along with these quilts. This isn't just about um, what's the best, um, fanciest quilt, but some wonderful stories that are, are behind some of these quilts. And so that's how I pulled together these quilts and um, I hope everybody enjoys the exhibit. Um, one thing you'll need to do, Megan, is um, you forgot to explain how they can ask questions um, when we get over to Marty. So you may wanna um, do that too. Thank you. I've actually thought of several things that I forgot to say in my first go round. So here I go again. Um, one of those things is, yes, um, if you have questions or things that you would like to add to the discussion, we encourage you to use the chat window um, to do that. If you're using a laptop, it's usually found at the bottom of your screen. If you're on a phone, um, it's probably also at the bottom of your screen. But to use that, it will probably navigate you away from the video for just a moment. Um, also, this program is being offered free of charge. Um, since we've been closed um, starting the middle of March, um, we decided that we needed to take our exhibit on the road or on the computer, so to speak. And this is the fourth program that we've done of this type. 
Um, and if you are appreciating those, if you are um, feeling that you can make a monetary donation to the Iowa Quilt Museum, I will put a link where you can find um, the ability to do that, to make a donation online. And we appreciate that. And we're not asking for hundreds of dollars, although we would welcome that. Um, typically a program like this, we would charge 10 or $15 for admission. So any amount that you're um, able to donate um, is greatly appreciated and will help us continue to offer these types of programs. We've decided that even when we're able to reopen in person, we'll continue to do these um, virtual meetings. In fact, there's no reason that we hadn't been doing them all along, except that we just didn't think of it and we weren't forced into that situation. So one of the silver linings that has come from this um, tough pandemic situation is that we're going to think outside the box a little bit. So, um, so again, please share questions or comments in the chat window. We welcome that. Um, but for now, let's turn things over to Marty and Richard. Um, why don't you give us a little introduction to yourselves in case somebody happens to not know all about you? Well, let's just do a short introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Richard and I, uh, we can sum it up. We've been partners in several ways. We've been married, I don't like to say how many years because everybody can add a number to 20 and go, oh, they must be at least. Well, we've been married uh, 60 years. We've been in business together. Oh. Since 1972, whatever yeah. that math is. <laughs> yeah. And you see, we're still married. So, um, and we've been in the quilting industry since 1972. Richard made the switch from nuclear power. It was an obvious thing that yeah. that training would be helpful. In. I, I called it decimal point shock. We rounded numbers off at a million dollars and below that they were insignificant. <clears throat> uh, my hobby of quilting turned into a business kind of overnight and uh, Fortunately, there was a bad uh, uh, few months in the nuclear power industry, and uh, suddenly Richard was available, and I thought, if you could just help for a couple of years and get this going, uh, but hey, two years became 10, 10 became 20, what the heck, it's all worked out great. So, so somewhere along the line, we started collecting quilts, antique quilts. And, uh, and we have a rather large collection. I call it the Richard and Marty Michelle quilt collection. In all fairness, Richard has purchased one. <laughs> and it's the one we're gonna talk about today. But I spent and, far uh, more on it than anything <laughs> she ever bought. <laughs> and I've purchased all the others. But, um, and like uh, the one behind us just happened to be, I'm telling you, it was just the top one on a pile in my office. But I thought, oh, it'd be fun to have a quilt uh, background. Now, if you want to know more, you know, uh, one of the big deal things we did, I had a good eye for talent. And uh, one of the things we did was, publish for Marianne and Fonz and Liz Porter, their first books. And, uh, and, you know, I think about so many things that we've done over the years that have really impacted the whole uh, quilting community. And that would cert certainly be right up at the top. For sure. That's great that you, um credit your eye for talent. Um, I think that that's often some, a skill that goes unrecognized, you know, having impact by lifting up others, um, not necessarily through one's own accomplishments, but by allowing other people's accomplishments to really advance the field. Marianne's got her hand raised. Um, let's see. I just want to- Oh, sorry. Is, I think- Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I think most people can um, 
can think of the five people, you know, through your whole life that really impacted your life and um, uh, meeting Marty and Dick and they're, they're believing in us, two gals from Iowa and they're 29 years old or so. It's just, you know, changed my life tremendously. Yeah. So always appreciate that. And, you know, we're really proud of it. That's yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I'm typing something right now. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about this quilt that is behind me on the wall. Um, since this is the main reason why we've um, all gathered today is for this exhibit and this particular quilt. I'm gonna go ahead and do a screen share to share a better picture of it. Um, and let's see if I can. Does everybody see a nice big picture of that quilt now? Mm -hmm. Yes. Good. All right. So this is um, the quilt that began your collection. Is that correct? No, it's not really the first oh. quilt. It's just the first quilt that began Richard's collection. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. So, so Richard, maybe you should tell us what exactly is it that drew your eye to this particular quilt? Kind well, of. Go ahead. I'm going to tell a little she, bit. She has a much better memory for the details. <laughs> <laughs> we walked into a quilt shop in New York City on our way to uh, LaGuardia to fly home because we had an extra half hour, right? And this quilt was folded and hanging over uh, a, a, a railing, railing. Mm -hmm. uh, not a railing, but a rod that was hung on a mantle. And the yellow sign that's on there that you might be going, what is that on the front? Was kind of spotlighted over the manual, ma mantle. mantle. And it was like a magnet. And Richard was there and went. Yeah. It's just the, the greatest thing I'd ever seen in a quilt anywhere at any time. Peace, B-E-A-C-E-D, by Jacob Shafter, 1890. Uh, so few men made quilts that we're aware of, and the P-E-A-C-E-D, and Jacob Shafter, 1890, we paid a it horrible just, price for it. Just it just called out to us. Yeah. But and, and we got back to, we didn't take it with us. Right, we, did, we didn't have time to do all of that or a, or a suitcase. And I was gonna be back in New York in about three weeks. So I, I said, can we pick it up when we come back into town? Sure, sure. So I think I went alone. And when I got back, the uh, owner said, um, do you really want this quilt? Uh, I have somebody who was just sure I was going to lower the price and is begging me for the quilt. Now, I've always thought it might have been seller's remorse <laughs> that he was the one who wanted that quilt back. But uh, I stuck firm. I knew, I knew I needed to go home with that quilt or uh, my name would be Mud. Sure. Well, and it's also interesting that this piece um, is, it's, you know, it's just added on top like a label, but it's on the front of the quilt in, in a location that doesn't make much sense at all. In fact, it, it forms, it, you know, it causes us to have to hang the quilt <laughs> landscape instead of portrait. Um, so there's a lot about this quilt that's really interesting, but any time a person can find a quilt that's dated, um, especially if it's dated in the 19th century, that really feels like kind of a marvelous find. Well, this morning I thought about, you know, I consider that we don't really own the quilts. We're just caretakers till the next owner comes along. And, uh, but, as long as I'm a caretaker of a quilt, I feel free to make up a story. As <laughs> long as I say, this is just my story, I've made it up, it fits the quilt as far as I'm concerned. 
And I thought, this morning I went, you know, I've never made up a story about Jacob. Hmm, <laughs> who could Jacob have been? Well, was Jacob a feisty husband who had said to his wife, you're spending way too much time quilting? And she said, well, it takes a while. You know? And he said, oh, anybody can do that. And she said, then do it. Do you have that wife? Do you think? Or was he maybe sick? And somebody was helping him recover from something and uh, made that quilt for him. Or was he a kid? And his mother, he was underfoot all the time. Or was he retired? Sidebar, you didn't send him the quilt that I made for you. No, I didn't. What's the name of that award? Silver Star. Silver Star Award. And Mary Ann and Liz Porter both sent blocks for a quilt that was made for Marty's Silver Star Award. Yep. And this quilt is full of blocks made by the most famous quilters of that era. It, it's just a fabulous quilt. I made a quilt for that event. And it was a pretty humble quilt. It was the only quilt I've ever made. But it had one very redeeming feature. There were five panels in it of family photographs that had been transferred. And at the end of the show or the awards, two ladies came up to me from two different tables to say that when I presented that quilt to Marty, all eight ladies at the table were crying. <laughs> so it's really sweet. It, it should have been in the show. And uh, well, I think they just didn't know about it. Yeah. And uh, I'm very proud of the impact it had emotionally. Well, and those are the best, both the best gifts and the best quilts really are the ones um, that have, have that meaning behind them. Um, and if you haven't yet, although you probably have Richard, you should really document that and put it on the back of the quilt so that someday <laughs> somebody else doesn't have to make up a story about it. It may appear in the Iowa Quilt Museum, who knows? <laughs> there you go, there you go. So speaking of the Iowa Quilt Museum, um, we said that you're in Atlanta, in Atlanta, but tell us about your Iowa connection for those um, who don't know your connection to our beautiful state here. Well, yours is shorter, so you can tell. Yeah, it, mine is Mary and Marty, no. primarily. <laughs> <laughs> and we met at Iowa State, and were married while we were still in school. And I'm a... Uh, third generation Iowan. Um, my grandfather actually ran away from the farm that my sister and I still own to, to fight uh, in the Civil War. I wish I could say which battalion group he was in, but I can't. And um, uh, our, my far the farm home I was raised in was built in 1885 and uh, still standing and uh, I was uh, uh, <laughs> we joked about you know at the Iowa State Fair they judge everything and when I was little they judged babies and so I was the grand champion baby health girl at the Iowa State Fair when I was three I was a girl state 4-H president when I was a senior in high school. And uh, then I went to college and married this guy from Illinois and I've never lived in Iowa since, but we still own the farm. And she was almost born at the Iowa State Fair. Oh yeah, that's right. Minutes away. <laughs> Minutes away, my goodness. That would have added to your grand champion baby health uh, girl, right? right? <laughs> For quite a while, we have no idea if it's still there or not. But there was a corner in the museum of the, uh, on the fairgrounds about Marty. Oh, okay. Yeah. 
So, so and I'd like to say with that 4-H background and all the rest of it, obviously born to be some sort of a quilting queen. <laughs> Quilting Queen sounds like a good segue to um, Marianne. Tell us about this. That oh, sorry, I'm not where I want to be. Tell us about this photo that you sent me just a little bit ago of Marty. I got to get back to my screen share. Okay. Oh, am I? Oh, yeah, wow. I thought that uh, I had a different picture in mind, yeah. Okay, can you hear me, uh, Megan? Yes. Okay, so um, early this year, I was working my way through um, uh, a collection of back issues of Quilters Newsletter Magazine that we have at the Iowa Quilt Museum, preparing for a lecture that my daughter Mary and I were gonna do at QuiltCon. Uh, called the Big Bang. It was, you know, uh, a mother and daughter talking about the quilting uh, revival of the 70s, you know, 50 years or so later. And so, I mean, it was like a walk back in time. I mean, uh, I, I forget, can you see the page that what issue of this magazine is? What year it is? I'm going to think it was around 82. Uh, 71, I think, or I saw it at the bottom of the page at first. Uh, 81, yes, of course, 81. And, um, uh, I, I don't believe I was taking Quilter's Newsletter at that time. I, I mean, I had not, until I was doing this research, I really had never seen this, or I didn't know that I had seen it. But here's Marty, the young tycoon. Um, she's judging a quilt contest. And, you know, um, when, when Liz and I, I mean, it's just so exciting to see this picture and see Marty with all her fire. I mean, she's still got it, of course. But, I mean, she, she's one of the handful of women who made the quilting industry. I mean, she invented the quilting industry. Uh, Bonnie Lehman published Quilter's Newsletter. Carrie Brazenhan started Quilt Market. Uh, Marty made it an industry through publishing and, and influence in all kinds of ways. And uh, when Liz and I, you know, had an idea for a quilting book, there, there, were, there was really only one quilting book publisher, and it was Marty Michelle down in uh, Atlanta with Yours Truly Publications. And you know, I typed a letter in the farmhouse out in Madison County on a manual typewriter, and Liz and I had photos, and we sent them to uh, to Marty, not knowing of her Iowa connection at all, and uh, kind of implied we'd written this book, and um, uh, the book was published in 1982, so, you know, not too long after this article appeared. Um, so, uh, you know, when she phoned up and said, we're very interested in publishing your book, I mean, I just, I can, I'll never forget that day. I was standing in the kitchen talking on a phone that was attached to the wall. And, um, you know, we, Liz and I went from being, you know, two you young know mothers. Where we met? Yes, we yes, yes, yes. Yeah, you guys were coming through Iowa and you asked if we could meet at the airport. Liz and I didn't know that there were meeting rooms upstairs in the airport. And I'll never forget, we brought these samples. I mean, we just, it was the most fantastic day for us. You guys were so nice and, and we were so excited. And I remember Dick asked if we wanted a Coke or something. And we were like, yes, you know, we, we, we haven't eaten in three days. And we were so excited <laughs> that we were gonna get to meet you in person and you were gonna bring a contract and everything that we just, um, I mean, you just, it was just, it was just the most, the best day ever because it, it launched us into what we didn't even know was coming. Yes, that's right. So I'll, I'll never forget that day. Yeah. I remember it also. <laughs> I still remember the room we met in. I do too. It was a big, we were at the opposite ends of a table and, and, uh, you know, the next thing we knew, Liz and I were doing the photography at Living History Farms on that vest book that was published in 82, coming to Quilt Market. And, um, and you know, you just, it's, it's like we were talking before this started about the, the article you wrote on the history of the rotary cutter. Now I know what, where I can find it. But I mean, you, you know that history because you were there. You were yeah. part of that history. Yeah. And um, I hope a lot of people know, I'm going to tell now, is it uh, Marty is the... Um, this year's the 2020 inductee into the Quilters Hall of Fame. Uh, that would have happened in July. 
Am I right? Which yeah. would have been in July. And, and Liz and I were planning to go there because you were there. Well, anyway, you were there. we got to see you last year in our, our induction. We both felt you should have been inducted way before us. Um, but it's a process that they do. But uh, so I think that's been postponed till next year. So I'll, if I don't see you before, I'll see you then. I think it has. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> postponed so, it cancel then yeah. i i think they're just pushing everything back a year yeah. but i don't really know yeah. so that means that our faces will be on the on that same wall with, with all my other heroes right <laughs> well and you mentioned um quilt market um so how long marty have you been doing the schoolhouse sessions at quilt market well we started we started um when when carrie announced that there was going to be a quilt market uh, because we had been selling our patchwork kits which was our huge business from 72 to 85 for years but we'd been at gift shows and at needlework shows and even a few sewing shows but there wasn't a quilt market and at first i knew carrie pretty well from some of the small shows and and I was like, oh no, not another show. We had one year when we did, as a company. 54 shows. We had staff and we had people, but it was still, you know, and I was like, one more, I don't need one more. Cause I wasn't really quite smart enough to think, oh, maybe I could get by with just one show instead of 54. But she decided to do it. And we were a 10 year old company by then. No, I'm sorry. We were only eight, eight years old by then. And, uh, and a considerable size company. We probably had 100 employees at that time. And uh, I, I said to Richard, if Carrie's gonna do a quilt market, we have to be there. And we had four authors by that time. And I said, let's call Carrie. And I think quilt market was either only, maybe it was a two day market then. And I said, let's call Carrie and see if we can bring our four authors and uh, invite, and we will do it. We will cover the whole cost and invite shop owners to come the day before market to our event. And well, I like to say I taught Carrie corporate sponsorship <laughs> because within an hour, she had gotten Concord and VIP to sponsor the uh, style show. And I forget somebody else to sponsor something else, you know, she's a, a, a quick learner. And, but we did the, we did this free for uh, the next like four or five years until our company was sold. And uh, then Carrie said, would you just do it please? And so we took over uh, uh, organizing and doing all the paperwork and so on for Schoolhouse. So. As long as there's been a market, we've been there doing schoolhouse. Well, I was I was at that first. Um, am I? Can you hear me? Uh huh. Yeah. I so I was at that first event with your four authors, and I had not met you yet, mm -hmm. and um, we hadn't done our book. We weren't doing that yet, and uh, I ha I was telling you the other day I took some classes uh, at Quilt market and it was expensive for me. I didn't have any money. I got myself to Houston. I had friends to stay with. I bought all the supplies. I brought my sewing machine and I was really disappointed in the classes because we didn't even use all the things that we had been asked to bring. And I went to your event and I remember sitting at those presentations and there was wonderful food and it was just beautifully done. And I thought I have learned far more in this free event than I've learned any in any of the classes that I took that I paid for. That's really a nice uh, testimonial. And I think it really stands for one of the things we've always done or tried really hard to give people their money's worth and give things of value. And uh, it's just been part of our 
our that's the Iowa way. <laughs> I think that's I think there's a, there's a whole lot of truth to that. But well, and I don't know if I learned that from, but it's yeah. I I don't maybe I learned that from you, Marty, or maybe we just knew that too because when Liz and I wrote that first best book, which sold for seven dollars, had the pattern in it. Our goal was to make it so that people really got their money's worth, mm -hmm. and so that you know that just everything they would want and need would be in that book. Yep. And do you he accomplished it. Do you recall that the Shamrock Hotel was the site of the second quilt market? And the Shamrock was one of the greatest promotional hotel events that ever happened. Practically everybody that had a name in Hollywood was there for its grand opening. Not for quilt market, but for the... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yes. I remember this horrible negative thing you don't about the you second You can dress night. him up, but you can't <laughs> take him out. <laughs> it was an evening uh, lecture, and it was in the dining room, and everybody was at dining tables, and there was a stage, and the lights went down, and I'm in the back of the room, and I can see this sea of cockroaches come out from like under I the said. table. <laughs> Now, I'm going to have a conversation and tell you a nice man-made quilt story. <laughs> we were traveling in Hawaii, and I stopped in a jewelry store, and there was a nice display of Hawaiian applique bracelets. Look, and I asked the gentleman at the store if he would bring that out to show me. And he said, do you quilt? And I said, yes, do you? Just being sassy. And he said, as a matter of fact, I do. And I, I said, well, I try really hard not to just say to men, why do you quilt? But I can't help but ask, tell me why? How did you start quilting? And he was a Vietnam veteran. And he said, I was badly injured and I was in Walter Reed for a long time when I came home. And he said, you may remember that we weren't really welcomed. And I said, yes, I, I, I do. And he said, well, I was in Walter Reed and all of a sudden one day somebody came and gave me a quilt and thanked me. And this is way before Quilts of Valor, but it certainly speaks, and I know Marianne and, and uh, Tony are both very heavily involved in this. And he said, I just said to myself, that is so wonderful. And if I ever get out of this bed, I'm going to learn how to do that and do that for other people. And he said, his wife, he said, is a real quilter. I make quilts. I give them to the police for uh, children that, and to firemen and so on. And I was like, okay, I'm never going to resist asking more questions because everybody has a story. And that was just such a beautiful story to me. She's reminding me of a Hawaii story. A good <laughs> friend, I'd known him for a while. And I'm sure he had no idea the size of the quilting industry. He happened into his first quilt shop oh. in Hawaii. And he thought, well, I'll find out how well Marty's known. And he asked the store owner, have you ever heard of Marty Michelle? And she said, no, but is she related to Stacy Michelle, <laughs> our daughter? <laughs> Stacy's uh, hand-dyed fabrics have been very heavily used by Japanese quilters to make Hawaiian quilts. And Stacy has taught Japanese teacher er, quilters in Hawaii many, many, many times, in addition to her many trips to Japan uh, back and forth. But of course, Stacy loves that story, <laughs> as I think she should. You know, Marty, um, I bet that that uh, Vietnam veteran, you know, the very first Quilts of Valor, before it was even called Quilts of Valor, mm -hmm. when Catherine Roberts had these quilts, uh, they were given to injured 
Well, no, it wouldn't have, well, no, you're right. It couldn't have been. They were from Iraq and Afghanistan yeah. wounded. Yeah. But it happened at Walter Reed. Um, so that's fascinating. Fascinating. Our sales manager in the 80s uh, was the most burnly, or badly burned Vietnam veteran to live. Wow. And he was in Walter Reed for about a year. And finally, somebody came in from Vietnam that was more badly burned than he was, and he felt like he'd been demoted. <laughs> Gosh. You would have known him, Marianne. Wayne. Wayne Kidd. Did, oh, yes, I did. Yeah. yeah. Wow. I didn't know that, though, I don't think. Hmm. Well, when we, when we uh, awarded the 100,000th 100, quilt of valor, it was a symbolic 100,000th because they didn't count them at sure. first. We did that at the new Walter Reed uh, Center uh, several years ago. So, Do you know uh, what, what, who received it? Uh, it was, we didn't really, uh, we, we awarded, uh, I think a half a dozen or so, oh. and we didn't, we wanted it to be just like, we know we've crossed the hundred thousand yeah, threshold. No, yeah, it was exactly, exactly. So. You know, um, and Megan might be having this question, uh, for you or her comment, but, um, we are hoping that one day, uh, we will be exhibiting your collection or, or part of your collection. Oh. We kind of have it penciled in for a future exhibit because uh, I think it was last year actually at the at Marion, Indiana at the Hall yeah. of Fame that you gave me a jump drive or I brought you a jump or somehow we yeah. uh, was transferred a slideshow of your collection. And I mean, you know, I hadn't known the extent of your collection, but I was with you in some of those early years when you would go off from the booth and you would come back with some fantastic and that's uh, not the whole collection that's just um, yeah. 80 or 90 pictures yeah. i think and some are duplicates yeah. uh, close-ups and so on so, well you have fantastic taste and i just i mean i remember thinking wow she's just gonna go buy that quilt or she just went and bought that quilt and um and you have wonderful taste and, and because you're a technician yourself, I mean, you really know, you can, you, you recognize talent even when the person is anonymous because they made this quilt and anonymously. And so I think uh, with, especially even if you didn't have the Iowa connection, but it also makes it really appropriate to, to show your quilts in, in winter set one day. And of course, then you'll come and we'll coordinate things. So you'll come in person, you and Dick, Absolutely. and we can have a party and, you know, be in person. It'll be wonderful. Yeah, actually, that those images was how I found this quilt for the exhibit because we were looking at those for a possible, you know, thinking down the future. And I saw that there was one that was dated 1890 yeah. that was from a, a male quilter, and so that's how I found that. I didn't realize that, Tony. That's that's so great. How how uh, serendipitous, and uh, um, that that'll be, it'll be wonderful. To have. Tony and I are both on the show committee, so we we love. That's one of my favorite parts of. Working sure. with the museum, I think it's true for Tony too. Is you know, kind of kind of like deciding well, we're going to have anti. You know, these will be vintage quilts, and then we want to balance that with something more contemporary or a single artist exhibit, so that it's always changing. We have a, a small museum in Georgia, also, and actually, uh, I have we have. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that eye slipped right in there. <laughs> we have 35 quilts uh, that were on exhibit there that got caught in the virus. <laughs> and uh, I the, the exhibit has been taken down, but I haven't been down to uh, uh, get the quilts out of quarantine <laughs> yet. <laughs> so one of these days I will. And I, I think it was just kind of a, a random selection of quilts well we have doreen speckman's quilts are in the exact same position they're still they're still folded and ready to go to back to wisconsin we plan to drive them there because it's not that far to milwaukee but we're waiting until we feel we can go are uh are your uh previous exhibit zoom meetings on file somewhere they are. You can find all of them on our website. Um, if you go to our current exhibit page, um, you can also join our email list there. 
and that's um, and then when I post a new video, I email those out as well. But I'll go ahead and put that link in the comments here as well. Um, okay. Our our website. Um, yep. Um, I while still I wanted to get to the Doreen. Yeah. Event, but actually, I was on a plane that day. That was my uh, last flight home. Yeah. The day you guys did her event. Well, and that was actually, we credit the Wisconsin Museum of Quilts and Fiber Arts for getting us started on this Zoom track um, because we still had Doreen's quilts hanging when the lockdown or the oh. quarantine began. Um, and so we closed that exhibit basically a month early. Um, and so they invited us to participate in that and we're glad that they helped us find our way with that, so. Nice. So we've talked a lot about your business of quilting and your collecting of quilts, um, but Marty, we haven't really talked about you as a quilter. How did you get started quilting even before okay. you decided to turn it, your hobby into a business? Uh, I was a textiles and clothing and journalism double major at Iowa State. And um, in my era, I probably I either had in mind that I might get a job at Meredith Publishing in Des Moines or be an extension home economist because I had all that 4-H career and so on. Um, but instead, I got married and moved out of state. And uh, uh, But I never gave up sewing. And uh, when we moved to Atlanta, which we, uh, my first job was actually the Dairy Council in Wichita, Kansas. but then um, I had two babies and I didn't work when we lived in Ohio, but we moved to Atlanta and I wanted to make a little money, but I didn't want a full-time job. So I started a little sewing school and we had a really nice living dining room and we took all the furniture out and set up sewing machines in the there. And uh, uh, Richard would illegally stuff mailboxes uh, telling about our classes and I I was ready for get those ladies all the way up to tailoring and flat pattern I wanted them to know everything I knew about sewing and as a six-year-old our daughter taught the ladies in these classes how to thread their machines <laughs> Because, you know, they didn't have their own machine and they said, Stacy, Stacy, come show us how to fill that bob in one more time. I don't want your mother to know. <laughs> but anyway, um, I found out that they weren't nearly as eager to get to bound buttonholes as I was to have that opportunity to teach it. And at the, I had been playing with patchwork. I had made Stacy's little summer outfits and I, it was a few years before the bicentennial, we were beginning to see quilts in magazines and I thought, well, that's fun. I could do that. I could do, you know, I have a sewing machine and I can do anything. And the ladies saw what I was doing and they said, ooh, hoo, hoo. no measurements no pattern alterations, doesn't have to look good on you when it's done. <laughs> we want to do that. And I said, I don't have any idea what I'm doing. You know, there were no books and a few reprints from the 30s that I could find. And um, I had learned about the quarter inch seam, which was a big change from five eighths inch seams in dressmaking. Uh, but, and I kept saying, I, I don't know what I'm doing. And finally I said to Richard, uh, I've told them that I don't really know. And they still want to pay me. Is there anything wrong with accepting that deal? <laughs> <laughs> and we agreed that it was, it was legal. And, uh, so I started doing the, uh, quilting classes and of course the first thing I don't know how I don't think many of you were old enough but there was no cotton fabric in 1969 70 71 to speak of it was all polyester double knit and so 
for them to have anything to do, I had to search and search and search for cotton fabric. And we made little kits and wrote instructions and uh, sold them kits. And then their friends wanted kits and then their friends, they and their friends wanted more kits. And so it was on a drive to Iowa for Christmas and we were driving late and mostly I was talking just to keep Richard awake while he was driving. And I said, oh, I had a little um, a consignment craft store with a friend and we had sold quite a few kits there. And I said to Richard, I think I'm gonna see if I can find some other stores in Atlanta who would carry our kits next year. And he looked at me and he said, well, if you're gonna do that, why would you limit yourself to the Atlanta market? <laughs> and I'm like, that was the start of my business education. <laughs> well, why would I? So uh, I went to the gift show. I knew about the gift show because of our little shop. And I went to the gift show and I asked all kinds of people if they would be interested in representing us with our kits. We had two. <laughs> and somebody said yes. And uh, the next week they took our puff Christmas wreath kit to the Chicago gift show and they sold a thousand dollars worth of kits at that show. Now that might not impress you if you didn't know that uh, uh, Impala Chevrolets were maybe fifteen hundred dollars then, eighteen hundred. Anyway, twenty six. It was a it was a thousand dollar a week. Engineers were being paid fifteen thousand a year, eighteen thousand a year. Uh, we went, oh my gosh, what do we do now? <laughs> and we went everywhere buying any cotton fabric we could, put $300 on credit cards and cut and made kits. And uh, by the end of that first year, it was a $50,000 year. And uh, we were like, I, I, I think we need to do more of this. <laughs> That's how it all started. The Lily and Vernon gift catalog was one of the top three. And we had the best selling product in that gift catalog. What we didn't know is that the reps that Marty found in Atlanta were filling a lot of those orders. And they had shipping, copied the instructions and they and, bought fabric. Including the typos in the instructions. And it turned out to be one of the better things that happened to us because we got very serious about this business, thinking that these people could put us out of business. And uh, unbeknownst to them, we had a booth at the January gift show right down the, yeah, right down the aisle from them. And they told people that we were out of business and, uh, they would come down the aisle and see that we were there. <laughs> and it, 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 interestingly, the next year, they were not back at that show and were unable to be found. So that was a major, major turning point in the early days. Yep. We've had a few memories that were shared through our chat window as well. So let me share those out. Um, Dottie has um, kind of seconded your account of the Shamrock Hotel, Richard. She remembers seeing the creepy crawlers coming out, but she remembered that that was the day that Marty introduced the pizza cutter thingy, the rotary cutter that changed everything. Yep. Um, Starian Cloverdans, who is an Iowan, re um, asked you if you remember bringing all the materials and stuff to Heirloom to Heirloom in 1983. I do. I do very much uh, on the campus at Iowa State and in that Linden, I think it was Linden Hall. It was a new dormitory since we'd been there and at the uh, uh, Art Center. Yes, it was, it was one of the early uh, conferences like that. 
She mentions yeah, that everyone was excited cameras. to see you and everything that was quilt related. Yeah, thank you. And then Joanne Sadler is a fellow ISU graduate um, in textiles and clothing. And she graduated in 1980, went on to study tour. Oh, she went on a study tour on spring break to Atlanta in 1980 and she toured your business. Oh, great. That was so much fun when the kids came to visit. And the professor that brought them called the Iowa State students the most obedient students in the United States. <laughs> Megan, I just sent a photo when, when Marty was talking about their, her puff heart and the kits and the products of them are early business. I quickly looked at my bunch of photos from Quilter's newsletter and uh, there's a photo that people might really enjoy for an ad that was in Quilter's newsletter for, I think for fabric frames. Remember fabric oh, yeah. frames were so popular. Oh my um, gosh. Yeah, and, and uh, so maybe, maybe, maybe you can pop it up and share it, uh, if, if uh, once the questions are all answered and everything. Yes, I've got an eye on my email and it's still somewhere in cyberspace, but I'll keep yeah. watching. Yeah. I, yeah, I think I saved it kind of big, but, but I found lots of ads in Quilter's newsletter for yours truly was a, a, an avid advertiser. There would be full page ads. I found a full page ad for our book, our vest book, um, for, uh, you know, you would do third, a column of, of products and lots of full page ads. And, uh, you know, yours truly, and, and I don't know if we said, if you said that the name of your company was yours truly. Yeah. So that's, that's a great story too. I think, I think so. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, uh, after uh, the and we didn't say what we do now, which is uh, we started in '95, uh, you know, with something that was just going to be a little short uh, retirement business. And what is it? 25 years now, uh, making acrylic tools for rotary cutting, and we make what'd you say? Over a hundred. Yeah. Over a hundred. We do a lot of patterns products. and books and yeah marty's middle name is accuracy <laughs> <laughs> it's so marty a accurate michelle. marty accuracy oh, michelle wow yep uh, i've got some extra stuff here i need to get rid of sorry about that but here there you can see this yep. ad are those are those people in those frames pictures you marty actually a lot of that do you remember sally paul I do. Sally Paul, we called her our West Coast Design Center. Uh, she worked for us part-time and taught school part-time uh, as an art uh, teacher in high school. And a lot of those pictures are from her family. But she really uh, had the touch on the, on the uh, soft frames. And oh my gosh, that was, you know, that I can't believe it hasn't resurfaced again. It's about the right cycle, 20, 25 years. Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, there also were um, fabric covered books, uh, you know, like a photo album or uh, um, I, I ran across those ads and, and, and we made them. We had them in our basket book, the second book you published. We had, we wanted everybody to have their money's worth then too. And so we had uh, piece baskets and applique baskets on anything, anything, so. I didn't, I didn't notice the date. Megan, does it say the date on that photo? What issue? 81. Oh, 81, yeah. Mm -hmm. We ended up with a company in Virginia in a small town doing the die cutting of the frames. And boy, did we make them happy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because the kit would have the cardboard, the die cut oval or the, or right. the cut out heart that you would then put batting and then fabric and, and, uh, you know, I mean, this is, you have to think back to without digital phone, di digital cameras in your phone and, you know, your photographs, your images were so precious and that was a way you could inexpensively right. use them as decor right. back when decor, before Martha Stewart, back when decor was more is better. More stuff well, is better. That's why, <laughs> that's why soft frames haven't resurfaced again, because nobody prints a picture anymore. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. know, the, the building we actually office in right now was a, because uh, we've sold our office buildings a couple of years ago, the last one, and the building we actually rent space in now is a repurposed 
a Kodak Southeast Regional Center. What is it, 600,000 square feet? 330,000 oh, square feet. Yeah, so think how big Kodak was. And we used to come over here and pick up our uh, processed Kodachrome yeah. uh, for all the books. Oh, and right. it's all gone. In fact, I heard a statistic not long ago that uh, in the photography era, there were it was considered there were two billion photographs taken a year. Today, it's considered there's one billion photographs taken a day. Yeah. Wow. Uh, you know, I think it would be uh, might be a little bit of interest to talk about the book publishing because of our connection on that. And um, and the difference again, you know, we uh, invested twenty five thousand dollars in a typesetting machine that now you could almost do it on your cell phone. But anybody with it, you know, today it's almost like somebody if you've got a computer, you are a publisher, and a lot of, a lot of that out there and. Uh, the things that we had to go through and the cost to develop a book was unbelievable. And, uh, but it worked then and, and what is happening now works now. And today you're a pattern publisher. If you have a home printer, uh, our printer happens to be 12 feet long and operates at two impressions a second. <laughs> but, uh, we're competing with somebody who's got that uh, device on their desk at home. You know, I was thinking earlier when I was wondering about Jacob and who he really was, I was thinking how fun it is that we're talking about antique quilts and just like, hey, it's, it's nothing. I'm so happy to be with all of you talking about this today in all these different states and wherever you are. And it's something that nobody could have imagined in 1890, right. probably not in 1930. When did science fiction movies and pictures start? Maybe then there was a hint of it, but it's just amazing, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Well, whoever Jacob was, um, it's neat to think that 130 years later, um, we're still sitting here admiring his quilts wondering who he was and um, even though we don't we don't know any of those details in some way that um, his legacy lives on through that um, which I think is the appeal to so many people about the creative process of, of making quilts and passing those on so I'm just amazed that 130 years later that quilt is in great great condition it really is it's fantastic um, you can the, the colors are just so vibrant um, and there's not a there's not a spot on it that's just not really so so he probably had some good quality fabric to start with thankfully mm -hmm. yeah well it feels like that's a good place to wrap up we have gone just about an hour now which the time has flown it always does um, so thank you, Marty and Richard, on behalf of the Iowa Quilt Museum for joining us today. Thank you to everyone who is online with us. And if you know someone who wasn't able to get on line with us today, we will post the video on our website and we'll share it on our Facebook page. Um, our website is iowaquiltmuseum.org and we can be found on Facebook at, um, at Iowa Quilt Museum. Um, just a recap, we will be opening our doors again on Monday, June 1st. We will have some shortened hours um, and some other parameters in place in order to do our best to keep visitors, staff, and volunteers as safe as we can. But we are excited that people will be able to come and see this exhibit in person. Tony has done a fantastic job of gathering quilts that really portray the breadth and depth of just quilting in general, but the way that men have contributed to the art and the tradition of quilting. Um, and it's just really a fantastic exhibit. So we look forward to welcoming you. Um, one more little bit, one month from today on June 27th, which is a Saturday, 
We are going to hold our annual event called the Madison County Airing of the Quilts. We have also made some alterations to that event. It typically is both indoor and outdoor displays. We've moved everything out to doors. So do the dance, say the prayers, cross your fingers that we've got sunshine and no um, rain on June 27th um, because we will have quilts hanging all over Madison County. Um, and we moved everything outdoors so that people could keep their distance. They could enjoy the nature and the history of Madison County and the beauty of the quilts. Um, so we will welcome people for that. You can find all of those details on our website as well, iowaquiltmuseum.org. Um, so, Tony, Marianne, anything else? We're just, I'm just really glad that we are going to be able to be open so that um, people can see these in person because as I discussed last week, you know, I remember seeing the, some of the paintings that I only saw on my um, textbooks when I got to see them in person when I lived out in Philadelphia it's like it's a whole different thing so even the fact that you can see them this way it's so much more impressive to see them in person so I'm really glad we're going to be able to open it up. For well people. and and one thing about about Tony's exhibit um, I think it's the 17th exhibit uh, in the history of the Iowa Quilt Museum and we have movable walls and so we're able to even though we have only one gallery we're able to rearrange our walls uh, for each one. And I think Megan and I, Tony, all of us on our board, uh, we, every exhibit is our favorite one. And I think we have a building and a gallery. You just, it, it always is beautiful no matter how it's arranged, but the way Tony uh, laid out the wall arrangement was a way that we'd never done before. And it's really Im impactful. It's very easy to keep your distance from people in our museum. You can't touch the quilts anyway, so so uh, uh, we we are putting all the all the elements in place to make your visit safe and to keep ourselves safe. Uh, so I urge you to come and see these quilts in person because it is a remarkable exhibit in a really beautiful space in a beautiful town. It is. And Marlene just asked a great question of um, what is the end date for this exhibit, and we will have it on display through July fifth. That's a Sunday. We are open seven days a week. Um, check our website for hours because, um, like I said, it's going to be shortened through the month of June, but we are going to be open seven days a week through July 5th for this exhibit. And then we'll be closed for just one day. We change the entire thing in one day. And on July 7th, we will reopen um, with an exhibit of quilts from the collection of Barbara Brackman and Deb Rowden called Out of Control. Um, much like you, um, Marty and Richard, they have collected quilts over the years together. And their quilts though, um, they have a special draw to quilts that are odd or strange where you might be seeing them and say to yourself, what was she thinking um, <laughs> when she made that? So that will be a really fun exhibit as well. That's great. Well, please everyone visit our website, www.iowaquiltmuseum.org. There you can find a link to make a donation to the Iowa Quilt Museum. You can find more information about upcoming exhibits. You can find videos from past virtual meetups. But thank you so much to Marianne and Tony for helping me host and to Richard and Marty Michelle for being our um, guests, our special guests of honor today and to Jacob Schaffner for creating this wonderful quilt 130 years ago that we are still admiring today at the Iowa Quilt Museum in Winterset, Iowa. So best wishes to all of you. Stay safe and stay healthy. And thanks so much for joining us today. Megan, a little bit of applause for Megan. <laughs> yes. Oh, thank you so much. You're too kind. <laughs> It was wonderful. Thank you. It was. And now you can see in the comments, um, people are commenting that they've really enjoyed. So we're glad to hear positive feedback from everybody. Um, share the videos with your friends if they weren't able to um, join us today and spread the word so that more people can enjoy this wonderful quilting tradition. So, all right. I'm ending the meeting. Bye. Goodbye, everybody. Have a Bye. wonderful afternoon. Bye, Tony. Bye, Marty. Bye, Bye. Richard. Bye. Bye.